witness, witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Wow. And there we go. Yes, sir. So hit me with it, doctor. Wow. Well, I'll just say this. It was a long hearing. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely should uh, reconvene mm -hmm. at some point for a more in-depth uh, sure. review of this. But, man, I did take a lot of notes. But uh, I wanted your help with something, DJ, real quick. Sir. Uh, a few things here that I don't think is public knowledge. Gang of Eight, Skiff. Let, let's start with those. Okay, Gang of Eight is like uh, the, the Senate has an intel committee, the House intel committee. So there's these committees and subcommittees that have to do with intel that have people who have TSSCI clearances. Um, the SCIF is a facility that looks like a, a bank vault. I'm, I'd have to Google it to remember it. I've worked in two SCIFs, and I still don't remember what the acronym means. But essentially, you have to have... Um, Sorry, I believe at least a TS clearance to get in to get into one. Um, it looks like a bank vault. It has like one of those combination things on it, and um, it can be sanitized. I think down to the secret level if everything's closed. Uh, but 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 yes, basically that's what it is, and that's where uh, people will have computers where that computer can be go above Sipper up to like the JWix. TSSCI level uh, and those networks that have that information. SIPR is secret internet protocol uh, uh, network. And then um, in, inside a SCIF, you could have higher level than that to top secret. Gotcha. And I tell you one thing that I noted here, several times it came up about how their systems were shut down. And it reminded me of quite a little while back, we had a, an insider with the Navy. Mm -hmm. that revealed a couple of things to us completely off the record, mm -hmm. and they were quite nervous to do so, but they were an engineer on the ship, mm -hmm. and they said that, number one, they encountered UAP UFOs frequently. Mm -hmm. Their systems would go down, and that it, it, it was his job to get the systems back up, and that they were terrified that they were being hacked in some sort of way or being probed in some sort of way that they could not stop. And number two, he also revealed that there have been fatalities with UFO encounters and that they were just easily dismissed, you know, as training exercises, man overboard, that sort of thing. We see it on the news actually too much, you know, Black Hawk's, go down out of nowhere, uh, everybody on board killed, uh, that sort of thing, you know. So that that caught my attention in, about the systems going down. Um, so a couple things I could speak to to that. One thing Bob Lazar talked about, his predecessor at the Area 51 facility tried to cut into, you know, they had that, uh, that reactor, basically, and it had some sort of a sphere Yes, thank you. I saw that, Shaq Valet. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. Like I said, I knew it was something yes. simple. And I've worked in there, and I still didn't remember it. Uh, but in any case, um, so Bob Lazar talked about he tried to cut into a plasma torch. That caused his death. And Bob was actually hired to replace that guy uh, that, that That's got right. hurt. Secondly, talking about EMI, um, w what shuts things down and interferes with aircraft systems. Um, I was a flight engineer on MC-130s, uh, Combat Talons, uh, C-130s, uh, you know, the g generic one, then MC-130s, and then AC-130 gunships. And from the very early days uh, when I started this, which was the year I went through school in 99, 2000, they had an EMI mitigation procedure. And I didn't know what that was for, but basically, hi, uh, that's okay, Julie. Uh, this was something that was done by our new friends at All Things Unexplained, and I was an invitee, but but thank you, Julie. Um, I appreciate your love. Um, in any case, so the EMI procedure was meant to, if we experience EMI 
and the aircraft started to lose power and we lost control of engine propulsion, it would be to shut off certain, a sequence of events to shut off certain electronic things inside the aircraft that controlled the engines. And that would put you in the most mechanical um, configuration to keep the aircraft flying, even if you lost navigation, you lost... Um, all the avionics, at least, okay, I'm still flying. Maybe I have an, a whiskey compass and an ADI, and I can see that I'm straight and level, and, 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 and I have a compass. So, yes, uh, EMI, well, like what they described that happened over Eglin, um, a real thing, and could have, like you said, taken down uh, aircraft that, that, that uh, just, it was never reported. Like you said, it was reported as a training accident, but it may have been the result of uh, EMI. Right, and I'm joined here by DJ from Calling All Bands. Thank you so much for joining me for this historic event today, the UFO hearing in front of the House Oversight Committee. Listener Shaq Valet clarified that SCIF is sensitive, compartmentalized information facility. And that's actually one thing I want to do after this uh, online is is post some definitions of some of these things that came up, like SCIF continued to come up, right? But there was no no clarification What's of what that meant. And... uh Man, I t- I've got so many notes here, DJ. Don't let me keep you past what you need to go. But the one specific thing they asked Rush one time, what was the earliest UFOs or non-human entities that we came in possession of or that he knows of? Mm-hmm. And he mentioned 1930s. Yep. This is a reference, although it wasn't said for whatever reason. This is a reference to the 1933 Magenta Italy UFO situation that apparently Mussolini was involved in Mm -hmm. and that we, for whatever reason, took possession of that craft. And I guess, you know, you can't separate the Vatican from this too. And we took possession of this in the Mm forties for whatever reason. But I thought that was really interesting that um, this came up 1930s because at first I wasn't quite sure what they were talking about there. Yeah, it was housed. Uh, They had it in some sort of a warehouse. And obviously, until after the war was over, it wasn't given to us by Mussolini. It was um, captured uh, and 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 by by, and I should say recovered by the Mussolini regime. And it was housed somewhere. And then, um, as you said, in 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 some negotiation uh, after the war was over during reconstruction, et cetera. Um, it was agreed that upon it would go to the United States. You know, we had liberated Europe to a degree along with the Brits. So, yeah, I don't don't know how that happened, but, yeah, it's very interesting. i tell you something else that really set my radar off. This talking about the nuclear treaties that I believe first came up in the 70s and that apparently were highly classified but yet brought up some sort of examples of ufo hostile ufo encounters Mm. part of this was declassified i had never heard of of any mentioning of such nuclear treaties and ufo incidents and a big theme that we've run into is you know mutually assured destruction simultaneous atomic destruction we know about this this affinity between nuclear and UAPs. I mean, what did what did you make of that? Have you got any insight into these nuclear treaties? So, yeah, if I understand it correctly, and I just want to put that out there, um, it, it's basically as a result of what happened with your friend uh, uh, and my fellow Air Force uh, brother, Robert Salas, and then an incident that reportedly happened in Russia. And I believe what David is talking about that uh, he said is in the open source in the archives. I think he said it was George Washington University archives is that um, there was a a mode of communication to communicate with the Russians and for them to communicate with us if there was a false launch there was a new, because they had a false launch that thank God uh, the Russians during the Cold War there uh, interrupted mechanically so that launch sequence could not come to fruition and launch on us and then obviously Robert's battery of six missiles were shut down. So once they figured out that, hey, something could happen that they had no agency over, they developed a framework to say, hey, don't don't launch. This is not this is not us. We're working on solving this problem because there are certain sensors that we have that will tell us 
uh, if they've initiated or they're launching and, and vice versa. So, yes. And I'm thank God that that exists. So we're all still here to talk about it. You don't know what the Holman rule is, do you? That that came up. I, I looked that up, um, and it, it it's not what... The way that he characterized it was like that they could compel somebody with this one specific rule that was beyond what it is. The the Holman rule, when what I looked up, appears to be financial in, in nature. You guys heard rumors about that. I, re- yes. I believe Representative Gallagher uh, raised that a few weeks ago. So That's what it funding. looks like to me. Yeah, and you know, one interesting thing about the funding that came up was this notion of private corporations and such getting funding uh, through different means, and I couldn't help but think about how we, you know, Robert Bigelow, Skinwalker Ranch, got funding for whatever was going on out there. And you know what? Even to this day, we're still not 100% sure what was going on, but yet he did get funding. Well, first of all, thank you, Simon, for saying that in the chat. I appreciate that. I'm sure you're a fan of all things unexplained uh, and and on their stream. And thank you uh, for joining us. Um yeah, um, so I'm sorry, Tim. Your your question once again. I'm sorry, I got lost in that. Well, it was just more of yeah. a of a uh, ins- of a. I noticed they brought up this notion between private yes. funding and okay. and where it's coming from. And I couldn't help but think of it. Made so, me think of Robert Bigelow and Skinwalker Ranch, right? Yeah, but before we go there, let's intercede into the conversation we had yesterday because it's germane to this. So. When they talk about interrupting funding and something that uh, you had brought up that was a concern of people in the community that private entities had these craft and were funding these and the government would go and take – well, obviously, we can't do that. So when you talk about interrupting funding is what we talked about. There's a contractual obligation between whomever is housing this, in this case, a private entity that's back engineering, but it is under a government contract. That's how you can affect – change on that is because we're under if if the private entity was funding it wholly funded in and of itself then we have no interest in that it's theirs right that's why i told you if the chances are i don't think that those relationships exist in that way because then the government could not get information off of what is yielded from that technology has no interest in it and, and uh, you can't cut off funding to something that you're not funding. But once it goes under contract, now, now that becomes something that they can leverage because Congress does hold those strings and therein the illegalities lie. And now right. relative to Robert Bigelow, um, it's interesting, but until it, it's a very interesting thought and, and it may be something there, uh, there, there. But in and he's been quiet, which makes you suspicious, right? He's been very quiet. But until we see something of an in you know an evidentiary basis, uh, there's not much we can say. But what what David tells them in closed session in the skiff, that could that could change things because maybe he knows something that that uh, Robert is involved in. But until then, it I can't attribute anything to him at this point. Right, and shout out to Lister Simon Stifler. Thanks. He said, love you guys. Thanks for streaming. We appreciate you, Simon. Simon himself also has military service, and we appreciate you for that. Uh, DJ, another thing that came up a lot is this notion of TSSCI clearance. Can you clarify that, any yep. for listeners? So top secret, you know, uh, they're, they're, the, the classifications, like he said, are there's confidential, there's secret. It can cause grave da- – the release of that information can cause grave damage. Uh, to the United States of America, and then top secret can cause exceptionally grave damage. So they make these distinguish, distinctions. So sensitive compartmental compartmented information or compartmentalized information means that you have a top secret clearance, and with SCI, you have been read into a program. Let's just say for just the sake of argument, you're there in North Carolina, and it's Bragg, and you're read into an SCI program that has to do with new army technologies, exo soldiers and and things like that that uh, that we wouldn't want uh, the rest of the world to know that we're working on this top secret uh, army technology that'll be used for ground troops. I let's say I'm going to represent the Air Force and I'm read into um, special operations stuff that has to do with AFSOC or JSOC. So you have it you have a TSSCI, I have a TSSCI, but and we're having dinner. So 
to the audience out there, does Tim have the ability to tell me about his army program that he's working on, this top secret program? Um, and, and do I have a right to know that because we both have TSSCI? The answer is no. Because after you've gone through a background investigation, you filled out an SF-86, you've gotten cleared, they've gone and talked to everybody from your elementary school teacher up to now to find out what kind of a risk or what ty- kind of a person, how can, can we trust him, can we can trust DJ? Yes, but I don't have a need to know about his program and he does not have a need to know about mine. So therefore, we can have dinner but I can't discuss the nature of what I've been read into. There's an NDA that you sign that talks about fines and prison sentences when you're read in and when you're read out when you leave. Same thing for Tim. He's read in when he gets into the program. He's read out when he leaves and goes to another program. Because even if he left that program a week ago and he signs out, his buddies in that program can no longer discuss with him what they're doing. He doesn't have the need to know. So that's how it works, and it can get to the granular level if you, if you, if you listen to what Bob Lazar said. He said that uh, even when he was working on craft, uh, individual Tim and I spoke about this yesterday, so it's a regurgitation, that if someone were working on ComNav and someone were working on propulsion, you could be in the lunchroom, but you, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell them what you had actualized relative to and what you were working on with propulsion. They couldn't tell you what they were working on. That was excellent. Excellent analysis, DJ, of TSSCI clearance. I want to say real quick, if you want to read a book for free or listen to a book for free right now on Audible, now's your chance, audibletrial.com slash UFO book. Like my narrated Killer Kudzu winner of our finalist for the Fiction Horror Award, and I got to get me some Fiction Horror in, you know, every once in a while there. And we have some new comments real quick. Uh, oh, interesting. Listener Dave, Gabriel Ortiz wants to know, doesn't the whistleblower amendment cover those with TSSCI? That's a DJ question. Uh, yeah, according to Congress, it does, and they're providing that protection. Um, they've set some limits on when you need to come forward. I think it was uh, 180 days. And um, I think for for per, uh, individuals, it was uh, like 60 days. And then for uh, private entities, it was 180 days. I'm not sure. You'd have to read up on what... Uh, I think Representative Gallagher put something out about that. But yes, they're they're essentially they're providing protection, which is what um, they asked David. Do you know individuals who are read into these programs that would come forward and talk to us? And he said, in a closed session, yes. Great. And DJ, I have one more thing for you to close with. But before we do that, can you tell everybody how they can check out the fantastic things that you've got going on with Calling All Beings? Well, thank you very much for, for the platform. You guys have a, a celebrated and very popular show, and you guys get some amazing guests on. Uh, but yeah, we are at Calling Beings on Twitter. Uh, and if you search for us on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms, we are Calling All Beings. My personally, I am call underscore at call underscore all underscore beings. If you want to, to reach me personally, uh, but yeah, it's uh, we've been able to make a lot of uh, friends uh, as a result of doing this, which is half of the reason that we're in this. <laughs> half the reason is to find out about the phenomenon, but the other half is just to have interesting discussions with people and uh, and make friends. And I really don't care how many Twitter followers those persons have. So we're That's honored right. to be able to meet you guys. Thank you. Quick update: Our dad gummit shot count <laughs> made it up to four, so we had four. Four dead gummits today in the UFO hearing. And I plan on imbibing all four of those shots at some point this evening. And by the way, we had the, oh, and Gabriel Ortiz says, thank you for that information. Yes, DJ, sir. we had the privilege of going on with Colin All Beans the other night. And let me tell you, a high energy show like you would not believe they bring it and they really, really get after it. And it's worth checking out. So my last thing before we to close today, and what a day it's been, a historic day, DJ, is something I'm calling now the Kirkpatrick Paradox. <laughs> and I and shout out to my my hero of the hearing, the fantastic Miss Fox. 
I don't think I've ever seen Ms. Fox before, but I'm calling her the fantastic Ms. Fox now because she dug right into this. And she pointed out it is a paradox. It is a problem. It's a contradiction. And I think somebody, for, I think for somebody, this is a problem on their hands. The fact that we have our official government UFO organization, the head of it, going on the record and saying, no, we don't have any evidence of non human intelligences. We don't have any evidence of captured UAPs or reverse engineering. And then in this hearing today, you know, we have three folks telling us we're dealing with non-human intelligence. We're dealing with things that are beyond our physics, and we are reverse engineering these things. So it is a paradox. These are both official positions. What's going on here, DJ? Um, so you, you're talking about that, that paradox. Um all I can say, um, I don't want to throw specific, throw any directed shade at uh, Dr. Per Kirkpatrick, but obviously I'm so glad that uh, Representative Fox and some of the others asked questions uh, and what Dave's, uh, Dave Grush said di directly refuted his testimony and it, it, it defies credulity, to use a word we used uh, yesterday. And it's unfortunate that um, he is probably receiving pressure from somewhere to take a certain position. Um, and it's kind of like if, if someone were, were to want to ask you about an aspect of your life, your previous life, um, that you didn't want to discuss and you were being forced to discuss it, almost like having to go into like a divorce court proceeding and having to relive something, um, uh, something that you're embarrassed about uh, that would paint you in a bad light. I, that's kind of like it seems like what's going on now, and he's probably being uh, compelled and told, um, you know, that uh, this is what we want you to say. and uh, Or, you know, it's his personal beliefs, and he's willing to to uh, put himself out there. But it, it defies what David said, and unfortunately for him, uh, he's going to be, be able to bring in people that will support his testimony, and then uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick will have to move from that position. However, since it's not a legal proceeding, I don't think, I mean, he can't perjure himself in this setting. Right. Well, you know, I actually spoke to some legal experts and, and got some opinion on this. And one of the problems is like today, even though the witnesses are under oath and technically it's illegal for them to lie, mm -hmm. it is incredibly difficult to prove a lie in any of these situations and basically un unheard of to prosecute it with any of uh, effectiveness. And matter of fact, the legal experts I spoke to literally couldn't come up with an example of a prosecution. Watergate. Yeah, Watergate. Watergate. Okay, there you yep. go. Yep. And 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 that's been quite a while back, right? G. Gordon Liddy. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so, others. so it's quite interesting. And and DJ, do you have any? What's your final synopsis on today's oh. historic hearing? Oh, and I do have a question for you uh, that oh. I want to ask about about your um, yeah yeah. Let me get just real quick uh, the investigation. You know, you and and CJ have something real interesting. Um, have real something real interesting. Is that something that you're going to pursue further? Say that again, DJ. So the uh, the investigation of a, a certain place that you, that you guys oh. located. Yeah, so I'm going to say shout out to Simon Stifler because uh friend of the show, he knows this location too. Okay. And it's it's just down the road from us, and it's a top, well, it's, as far as we could tell, a very high-level top secret facility, apparently 13 stories deep underground. <laughs> the supposed inspiration for the facility that you see in Stranger Things, the show, and it's owned by AT and T, and it's just there, right? But it has no purpose on paper, no purpose on paper. But yeah, we're definitely going to pursue that. We're looking into a lot of different angles on that. But I, you know, DJ, you and I were talking. That's just one of those examples of how we do have this mingling, confusing mingling of private entities. And Matt, well, you know, actually, somebody made a good point about AT and T to me. To call them private entity is actually a little misleading because 
I believe they're actually ran by the government for the most part. Um, I don't. Right, well, let me say that again. Yeah, they're dependent sense. on the government in terms of monopolies and that sort of thing um, and legislation. Like they're kind of codependent. Like AT and T would not be successful without government interaction, right? Sort of like public schools, I guess you'd say. Um, and they're, and they're subject to to government regulation, of course. What AT and T has going on, but yeah, we're gonna look into it. it it's so intriguing, and it, but it's pa- all part of this confusing, you know, situation, the UFO phenomenon. And what we've got going on and all this mingling of top secret stuff and government organizations, private entities and and all that. So, yeah, thanks for bringing it up, DJ. Yep. We're, we're hoping to turn that into a special. I mean, we'd like to find out more and we'll just see what happens. Can I get it? Amen. But yes. uh, final thoughts. It was an historic day uh, without question. And it's taken us further. As I said, there's. You know, we start off with with uh, you know Dave Fravor and coming forward, and then the 2017 article that got you know got us Christopher Mellon, the highest ranking highest ranking government official we've ever had, come forward to 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 bring this into the public, and then Lou Elizondo, uh, the highest person that was involved in uh, the UFO program because he was a a director of a tip, and it was great to hear Dave Grush because they you know the uh, Susan Goff and company tried to squash Lou Elizondo. He wasn't directly responsible. You know, they, they tried to uh, to diminish what his role was. And then, excuse me, Dave Fravor actually said, yeah, we we, we were contacted by uh, Jay Stratton and, and, and then made report with uh, Lou Elizondo, which is great. Um, that, but now with David Grush, this has raised the game to another level because of the fact of um, his clearance and... He was told things that I think uh, maybe Lou Elizondo was not told uh, and came forward in a way through a process, through a couple of processes, a DOD, IG, and then an ICIG complaint. And now, boy, it's going to be very difficult for them to completely obfuscate what we have from our legislators, our elected representatives. So it was, it's bipartisan. It's, it's uh, anything that's bipartisan in the way our country is so opposed to one another today to see people, could this be the beginning of not only finding out the nature of our reality uh, that, that we don't know. And that, you know, also goes to what Tim and CJ are looking at part of our reality that, that uh, the public isn't aware of. And some secrecy is necessary. We need to keep our adversaries at bay. There are people out there that want to do the American way of life harm, and we have to keep them from getting anything that would give them any advantage over us. So that 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 must remain. However, um, some reasonable, intelligent level of disclosure should happen. And I think largely the f- this is, as I have said, uh, uh, when David Grush came out, this isn't the the beginning of the end it's the end of the beginning if lou elizondo and dave fravor and them were the beginning then this is the end of that portion and now we're moving into a new phase so um so anyway that i i I think it was an amazing day um and i'm very uh inspired by by it i thought yes every question wasn't awesome every uh representative question wasn't off uh, awesome but if we can get that and we can f- find maybe this is the lead in to more bipartisanship, that's very important for our country. Um, and so, you know, on both counts, I mean, these are A pluses in my opinion. Right. Well said. And I just want to close with this. So, uh, as Avi Loeb told us, you know, well, and this came up in the, the hearing today. This need also there is a need for public contribution for the, you know, not just the military and not just NASA and not just the Galileo project, but the public can contribute. And I believe it was Graves that said, hey, we need to get technology out there that allows the public to actually make contributions. And I thought that was a 
very interesting statement. It makes me yes. wonder, maybe there's something on the precipice of being released, and this might be the impetus for it to, to get out there to the public. So, as hey, Tim, Avilo... Yes, sir. I just want to say, you made a great point there, because we've left out the civilians in this. You know, yes. Civilian, just persons of that that one gentleman the guy who is the young freshman who said i wasn't a pilot and in fact he he is a glider pilot said how does just your regular person who isn't a pilot report we need that mechanism that they can report and that data especially if it's from a civilian uh becomes public absolutely i mean we know there are a lot of pilot encounters out there that are happening in radio traffic and and sometimes they get captured by folks like over at the Black Vault, you know, and and they get released. But it just goes to show you that was a, a, a rare occurrence for it to get snagged where we could hear. How much do we not hear? Right. Ben and Hansen, so, too. Yes. And, and look at the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down over, uh, you know, off the coast of South Carolina, went over the across the entire country. The only reason that was known about is because a dude, I believe he was in Montana, didn't let it drop. He got basically got NORAD on it, his own self, right? Like he said, I see this thing up there. It's bizarre. I'm getting to the bottom of it. And this was just John Q. Public. But just think, DJ, if he had not done that, we would have never known about it. Mm. And I guarantee you, we would have never known about the three UFOs shot down over Super Bowl weekend immediately following that. So the public does, can play a large role in this. And as Avi Loeb told us, the skies are not classified. One thing we got to do is get off these, unless we get some new apps that we can use to record them, but get our face out of them. Look up to the skies. The skies are not classified. You know, shout out to Bigfoot. I got some Bigfoot behind me. The woods are not classified. Get out in the woods. Take a hike. Look around. Go camping. Look up at the stars. We can all, we can all collect data. The sky is not classified yet. So shout out to DJ calling all beings. We appreciate everybody out there. I'm going to get out of here. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks. You, like. Share. Follow. All things unexplained. Swag and much more at linktree.com slash ATU podcast. Bigfoot UFO dot com. So some of that I think, sir, will say for close session. That was dope, man. <laughs> <laughs>